Hi, this is Ash Whitener. And this is Justin Blinko. And welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. On December 4th and 5th, we went to Mexico City to interview some of the brightest entrepreneurs in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space at the Latin American Bitcoin Conference. We left with a number of amazing interviews, and we're really excited to share one of them with you today. Please help us out by following us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes with links and contact info to everyone we speak with can be found on our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com. Enjoy the show. If you want to save 5 to 20% off of everything at Amazon using Bitcoin and support Liberty Entrepreneurs with no cost to you, check out the show notes at libertyentrepreneurs.com and sign up for an account with purse.io using our affiliate link. Welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. With us now is Tour de Meester, co-founder of the Rothbard Institute in Belgium, as well as two Sudbury schools in Belgium and the Netherlands, which teaches children and young adults ages 4 through 18, a laissez-faire type of education, which concentrates on entrepreneurship and the principle of the pursuit of happiness. Tor was also the author of a financial newsletter in Europe for a Dutch audience and is the co-founder of Adamant Research, which produces financial newsletters each month with a focus on cryptocurrencies. Tor, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. So Tor, fill in the gaps here for us. Give us a little bit more background about yourself. Uh, well, I understood that um, you guys uh, have a podcast with uh, aimed at young people who might risk getting wrapped up in um, the libertarian movement in the sense that there is political aspirations or basically trying to get rid of a lot of things, but in the process they might get stuck in, in, in being very unfree in their own lives. And uh, yeah, I, I can really relate to that. I, I was a libertarian from, I don't know, really from maybe age 20 and then age 20, 23, I think I became anarchist. Because the social contract thing didn't didn't make sense, uh, and so yeah, I can I can definitely uh, relate to that. Um, I had some academic aspirations because I really bought into the Hayek's notion of like, oh well, we'll just influence the elites, and those are the academics, and then from there on, they will you know it'll trickle down, and they'll talk to their students, and that's how you change the course of history. And I. Yeah, it was a really big disappointment over time that it it didn't, at least I still believe it. I don't think it'll work. And even if it does work, it's incredibly slow. And uh, I became very poor in the process, like literally. Like there were days that I I didn't have money and I, I had hard, had no food in my closet. I had to like go out and buy like some banana and some nuts because I was like going all in with translating this, this book, um, about Austrian economics and then also uh, piling lots of effort into the Rothbard Institute and basically neglecting my own um, freedom, my own needs. And, uh, and so gradually over the course of about two, three years, I made a shift towards focusing on taking care of myself, but then at the same time trying to find ways to not have to compromise my own values in, in doing so. Yeah, that's very well said. You, know, you don't have to compromise your values to take all of your knowledge about peace and freedom externally and turn that internally and try to live a life of freedom and peace, hopefully that other people want to emulate. The main reason that we're not free is because our, our, the thoughts in our mind control us. And you know, if we start focusing on how can I toward or how can I, Ash, live a freer life, we hope that that brings more happiness, which we think is going to happen, and um, other people want to emulate us. Uh, sp speaking of young people, tell us more about the Sudbury School and, and what that is and how you got started with that. I grew up in first a regular school and then at like around age eight, my mom said like, oh, there's this new school in town and it turns out it was a Frenet school, which is uh, alternative, not similar to Waldorf, but, but it was similar in the sense that it was also deviating from the norm. So I kind of had some experience with some more freedom in school. And then I had a horrible experience in, in, um, in high school. And so I was curious to do something with kids because I was also in Boy Scouts. So I was a leader 
And then uh, that just crossed my path as I was a student in Ghent. Some people were founding a, a new school and I had actually vaguely heard about it. So Sudbury Valley School uh, was founded in 1968 in the, the States, in, in Framingham, Massachusetts. Um, they've had over you know, the, those 40 years, they're still in existence, uh, usually had about 150 to 200 kids uh, running in the school. They have no age groups. Um, they have um, democratic um, rule, which basically is a school meeting that gathers every week and um, that votes on, not really on like, oh, everybody has to wear blue socks or something, but it, it's always focused on the safety of kids in the school. For example, like if you walk around with uh, hot drinks, you put a lid on, you keep a lid on it because you don't want to burn a four-year-old, things like that. And so that space, the fact that there are no age groups, that there's no compulsory uh, classes, no compulsory examinations, really opens up a lot of energy for entrepreneurship, basically. Kids exploring what they're good at, kids being creative, building really intricate um, artworks often. Uh, and you see that also in the in what comes out of those schools so if you look at because they have a long track record by now it's about 35 years of graduations and they see that i think it's about 48 percent of graduates start their own business uh, just based on their experience in the school they were always encouraged to um, organize a raffle or organize a, you know sell ice cream because you want to build a tree house and you're you're raising funds to do that uh, it just comes natural for for those kids and that was really inspiring to me so would you say it was your own disapproval of your experience in school, why you wanted to help create a better environment for young people and children in hopes to give them more control and choice over what they learn to try to bring out some of their passions and even possibly entrepreneurship? Uh, yeah, I had, I had a really bad experience. And so for me, it was like, oh man, if only I could have gone to a school like this, I would have just eaten it up. I would have loved it. And then there was like some doubt, like, well, could this be for all kids? Like, can it work for all kids? I did a lot of research. And yeah, I think it's it's not for all kids, not because the kids themselves necessarily can't handle it, but I think often parents are resistant. And if you send your kids to a school like that and you don't really believe in it, it's very hard for the kid to to deal with that because they're like torn between camps like the parents think like oh you should you know do your reading or do your math and then they come to this free environment during the day yeah and that that can be really confusing and disorienting for, for kids so after the schools you got into financial investment writing what's the economic model around that how do you monetize how do you create a business you as the author what was the benefit how did that benefit your own learning yeah like the way it came about for me was Doing the Austrian economics thing, I, I really was learning about systemic risks. And around 2006, I started becoming uneasy. 2007, like something's really amiss. And I want to be free. I kind of want to, at the time, I think it might have been a little bit later, I was working in a store and it was like a physical box shaped. It was a nice store, but it was box shaped. And I really was like, man, I feel like I'm in a box. <laughs> I want to be able to move out and like go somewhere if there is a crisis or whatever. So I gradually, I started writing more and more online. I think since 2005, probably I had my own first little blogs and I uh, did more and more of that stuff. And uh, gradually I went more and more into, from economic theory, writing about uh, what's going on, current events, trying to process for myself because the economic crisis was coming up and I really wanted to understand so then I had a free newsletter for a while and uh, I got noticed by somebody who, who had a big network and uh, who was a successful publisher in, in Belgium and the Netherlands. So we talked uh, a couple times. At the time I also had just this big bulky report that I wrote uh, for free just to basically try myself. And so he uh, actually suggested like, why don't you do your own newsletter? And it was really appealing to me because, and the revenue model as you asked is very simple, like people, uh, uh, want to know your ideas and want to use them and will earn back the investment that they make. They invest $250, uh, the ideas in the newsletter, not only like, oh, this amazing stock tip, but I feel like a lot of the newsletter writing is about basically being available and being a support for people to to expand their horizon into the future, like not just look at the next month, but okay, have a five-year investment project and like basically guide them along the way. Um, and so 
uh, for me, the learning, basically I was trying to solve my own problem. Like my problem was, I feel like I'm stuck. I don't know what's gonna happen in the economy. Uh, how do I deal with this? And then like by writing about it for free and then eventually becoming good enough to be paid for it, I kept doing that and I got paid for it in the process. So I feel like that was amazing that I could also, for example, go to conferences and learn a lot more than I would have been able to on my own. Um, yeah, so bring us to the present moment. I know that you're a co-founder of Adamant Research uh, with, a, with a focus on cryptocurrencies, which is another passion of yours. How did you get to the point from being a financial writer doing this as a hobby for free to starting to get paid for it and then co-founding your own research and newsletter? Uh, yeah, it, was, uh, it took a while that to, like, for that idea to come to fruition. Um, I sensed around 2013 that there was a bit of a mismatch between my audience that I had in Belgium and Holland and what, I, what my passion was with cryptocurrencies. Like the, the age profile was a bit older, uh, I felt like. And so I, I was kind of pushing the, the curve and the limits of what people were willing to invest in terms of... I basically, I was aiming for a smaller niche than what was available in Belgium and Holland. So by yeah, October... Yeah, I guess mid 2014, uh, 13. Sorry, I decided to find somebody else, a successor, to take over the newsletter. And then by October, November, actually right at the cusp of that huge rally, was when I I was free from writing the newsletter, and uh, I had the I did two angel investments as well. I I kept going to conferences until May 2014. Uh, at like around $600 or something. And then I took a break because I wanted to decide where I was going to live. It, uh, right now I'm in Mexico, Mexico, Panama. Um, I wanted to figure out with whom I wanted to spend my life. So I like explored the, the, the dating life that's been like, not that I had many relationships. I basically had, um, uh, hooked up with my girlfriend in the U.S. And, uh, and then also slowly started working towards uh, building the business and really honing down what it is that I want to do and I really wanted to take my time for that so it's been a year in the works uh, also setting everything up it's it was longer than I expected it's a uh, it's a yeah interesting but yeah. how important would you say that going to conferences was for you and the networking opportunity and the potential that you got from going to conferences I think choosing your peers is really important like choosing who you hang out with that really defines what you can achieve, like what you're basically your visual limit, like these people who challenge you really uh, bring you further. I think conferences are a great place. Often like I would go to one conference and there would be like two or three people that I would stay in touch with for one or two or three or four years after. Um, so that's been, yeah, really valuable uh, to me. There's also gatherings that you can go, to. there's lots of stuff online these days. Like you can listen to podcasts, call in, to call in shows, um, do Google Hangouts. Uh, like you don't need a lot of money to travel to, to really start um, surrounding yourself with uh, people that are entrepreneurial. And also what, what for me was really important was to be pretty ruthless with relationship hygiene. I really cut out a lot of people out of my life who, you know, maybe they were jealous or maybe they um, just uh, didn't want to go where I was going. So they were always kind of suspicious and negative. And I mean, usually I would have a, an honest conversation and then things would, I would just move on. Uh, but that was pretty tough. I really had to work hard to, to, yeah, start thinking consciously about relationship hygiene. Who do I do want in my life? Who do I not want in my life? What's been the result of relationship hygiene? Well, I feel like I know where I, like, I know where I stand. Like I know who I have in my life that I trust. Um, I know what standards I have. I know what I expect from friends. I know what I, like, obviously not to perfection, but it's been like the past three years. I really focused a lot on that and it really helped me gain, gain confidence because if, if, if it's all mixed together and you don't really have standards, I don't know. It's like, ah, I kind of feel bad and I don't know why. And like that pro also I, I did therapy for, it's been a year and a half that I've been in therapy really intensely, uh, just looking at if you look at your brain as some kind of a, an operating system, well, it has a genesis. It started being built from when you were born, and a lot of that stuff was built in the first years of your life, the first 5, 10, 15, 18 years. So therapy has been really great to like kind of reconstruct, like, why am I, why do I think the way I think, or why do I feel things in certain circumstances? I think that that's so important, Tara. I'm so glad that you brought that up. You know, I'm a big supporter of Stefan Molyneux, who talks about this type of 
every relationship is voluntary, right? And you don't have to keep people in your life that are giving you constant negative energy and to appreciate that your genesis block of your brain did start whenever you were born. And just because you don't have memories, like you don't have memories of that type of stuff and the interactions, that doesn't mean that your persona and your mind doesn't remember that. So you know, choosing your friendships and who you surround yourself with is very important to your mental health, I agree. Tur, who are some of your role models? I had a lot of disillusions, so I, I feel, I have had a lot, like in the past, and I, yeah, that's an interesting question. I feel like I really had a succession of like role models, like I had a Tony Robbins phase, I had a Stephen Covey phase, I had a, a Stephen Molyneux, I listened to lots of his podcasts, I had um, like role, also entrepreneurial like role models, definitely also here in the Bitcoin space. Um, I really try to look at people's life stories, but then at the same time I try to be critical because sometimes I, I tend to like put people on a pedestal and then they're kind of shitty to me and I'm like, well, why did I do that? Like if, you know, like, um, was I right to, and like, and also like thinking about why do I put people on a pedestal? Why, how did that begin? And, um, but I feel like, I, I yeah, I, I don't know. I, right now, I think I try to compartmentalize my role models more. It's like, all right, I admire that person for these things. And I admire that person for those things. And that's what I want to emulate. It doesn't mean that I have to be best friends with that person to still admire that part of them. So like right now, I don't know if I have like, a, a, you know, a specific name to be like, oh, wow. And like one dissolution, for example, like Alice Miller, like, oh my God, if you look at, I mean, this may be a bit too niche I don't know about your audience, how deep they're into self-knowledge and those kind of things. But this is a woman that was ad admired across the world for helping people to reappreciate their childhood and be critical of their upbringing. And there is this information that is coming out now about how incredibly horrible she raised her own son and how abusive she was. So I think it's important to be very, to be critical and, uh, you know, not cynical necessarily, but, but to be really critical about role models in, in general. So Tur, we're at the Latin American Bitcoin conference and I recently read a paper of yours about your thoughts around investing in Bitcoin. Could you summarize some of those thoughts and what the space looks like as far as investment opportunities? Three words, buy and hold. No, <laughs> uh, no um, I think uh, we had a one year and a half consolidation period. There was definitely some overheating going on in, uh, in, in 2013, late there, uh, early 2014. I did not expect the, the, you know, the, the, the winter to last so long. I think I underestimated the extent to which the mining space was over-invested and then had to deleverage. And basically, miners having to sell all their coins into the market really over time depressed the price. But I think right now we are really getting ready for a, a new rally. If you look at the Google search trends, if you look at just the kind of amazing stuff that's been built under the under the hood, sidechains being launched. I mean, that was just talk to one or two years ago. They're actually being launched. Uh, all these amazing companies, the quality of the companies has gone up. They, there's been some... Just talk to some of the Bitcoin exchanges and ask them, who are you building partnerships with? And then all of a sudden you learn, oh, I can give you the exchange, Mexican pesos, and two hours later, I can cash it out in China for Chinese yuan. This is happening today. It's just incredible. And that's based on the Bitcoin infrastructure. And at the same time, sorry, this is like, <laughs> this is like what I get riled up about. At the same time, uh, the financial system is really in, in horrible straits. Like, look at just the CAPE ratio. I don't know if you guys, the, the, the audience knows it, but the CAPE ratio, cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio of stocks around the world, uh, is now at 20 uh, on average. In the West, it's 21. In the US, it's 25. A healthy average uh, is between 10 and 15. Stocks are overvalued. We're probably going to have a crash there. Uh, oil went down huge amounts. The dollar is so... Like, what I'm saying is we have dislocations happening. This is not the end of, uh, of volatility in the markets. And there will be panic. I think there will be panic. If not, the coming year... I'm pretty sure, actually, that somewhere in the next two years, there will be a panic. And Bitcoin is going to benefit from that. I feel pretty certain about that. Do you still see Bitcoin as a safe haven? Do you see gold and silver still as safe havens? And if so, why? Uh, yeah, both. Because they're they're private. Just because, you know, you don't have some, some dude with a beard who, who can print however much he wants of it. And there's at the same time, there's a great, great need for liquidity, for money, for... Because that's what happened. In the time of crisis... 
uh, which is I think that time is coming back. People need to be able to move quickly from one asset to the other. And money does that. Money is, is the blood. Like if you look at a human body, blood is through the medium through which communication happens. But we have anemia. If you look at fiat money, they're just poisoning the bloodstream. And so, yeah, you obviously, you know, you don't want 100% in Bitcoin. You don't want 100% in gold, but own some gold, some silver, some Bitcoin. And, you know, so if you if you like to have some stability, of course, own some dollars as well, you know, own some, own some fiat money as well. But I think being in cash, largely speaking, is, is probably the way to go right now. All right. To our last question, what advice would you give someone that is getting interested in economics? They're starting to understand how economics plays a very big role in freedom in general. They're starting to learn about Murray Rothbard and Mises instead of staying in that academic realm what advice would you have them to really start bringing some of that freedom into their own life if there's one piece of advice it would be to really question everything like for me the, the beginning was like all right these ideas are amazing but i want to send my kids to a private school and i don't have that six thousand dollars a year i don't have it how do i make that and like try to question like how do i get there and also don't be afraid to ask people but also question your role models because that is what Eventually, I was very much put off by what I found and discovered in the academic world. And maybe I just looked at the wrong places and asked the wrong questions. But for me, it, it, I feel very, I don't know, I feel, I feel like that really helped me find, more, find out more about who I was, what my values are. Just be ruthless and questioning everything and everyone. And um, yeah, I don't know, like even me, like what do I know? Seriously, like, eh, you know, if you find inconsistencies and in stuff that I'm saying or... And I'm actually curious, like people, I don't, I really don't mind if people would send me an email or uh, that's talk about relationship hygiene. I never just walked away from friends. I always send them a letter saying like, hey, I, I'm concerned about what's going on. And like, here's the things that and then when, you know, when that dialogue was really stuck or these people were abusive, then I moved on. So I think just being question everything and be 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 gentle about it. That, that would be my my first thought. Tour Dumb Easter, thank you so much for joining us today. Would you like to plug anything or give contact details? <laughs> well, if people like what I said, you can just uh, Google my name and uh, I think my Twitter account comes up first. Usually that's where, I, oh, and also Facebook. I don't mind friending people, especially in the, in the libertarian space. I'm, I'm really curious. Uh, so my name is T-U-U-R, comes from Arthur, and then D-E-M from Madrid, double E-S-T-E-R. I've done this many times. Thank you so much, Tor, for joining us today. If you want to save 5-20% to off of everything at Amazon using Bitcoin and support Liberty Entrepreneurs with no cost to you, check out the show notes at libertyentrepreneurs.com and sign up for an account with purse.io using our affiliate link.